Ian McGregor is a hardline business dictator from the USA who has no social conscience in business. He doesn't like involvement with trade unions at all. I remember one occasion when we went in to see him and the heavens were opening up for us. There was uh, privatization, redundancies, job loss. And he, t he said to me, well, what have you got to say to me, Bill? We were very disappointed with that. He's completely anti-trade union. We discovered that in the early days when he was boasting to us about how he defeated the American uh, coal trade union on the West Coast in the open cast sites. I don't like what he's doing, but he's a very, very determined uh, man. And he showed this very, very clearly uh, during that period at Salt Lake, Arthur Scargill. He knows where to be at the right time. He knows where not to be at the right time. Um, he's a good street fighter. With the coal strike now in its 32nd week, Ian McGregor and Arthur Scargill are still a long way apart. Talks resumed this evening at ACAS, but little common ground has yet been found. Just how prepared are these two men for what could still be a fight to the finish? Ten years ago, Ian McGregor took on the mighty American Miners' Union and broke them in the coal-rich western states. In England, Arthur Scargill took on the government of Edward Heath. He helped break that too, with an army of pickets at the Saltley Coke Depot. Mr McGregor and Mr Scargill then have both tasted victory, and now they seem just as determined to win again. Tonight, World in Action reports on those events of ten years ago that have shaped their attitudes and ambitions in the present dispute and beyond. Events which, in hindsight, were a dress rehearsal for the Cold War. Unlike Britain, coal mines in the United States are owned by private companies. But, as in Britain, the management hasn't always seen eye to eye with the miners. Ten years ago, one coal owner settled a dispute with a ferocity which even in America was considered extreme. This was Brookside Mine in Harlan County, Kentucky, in 1974, when a company foreman opened fire on pickets after a year-long strike. The miners had gone on strike because the company would not employ them after they voted to join the United Mine Workers of America. When the shooting stopped, one picket was dead, leaving a young widow and child. The story of Harlan County has haunted the miners' union ever since. They feared that the dispute signaled the start of a wider campaign by the coal owners to break the union in America's mines. Until Harlan County, the union, under a formidable leader, had built up a reputation as tough guys in the American trade union movement. Organize the unorganized. With organization, you have the aid of your fellow man. Without organization, you are a lone individual. Without influence and without recognition of any kind. An exploitation of you and your family when it pleases some industrialist who desires to make money from your misery. As more and more miners were organized by the union, wages, health, and pension schemes dramatically improved. By the mid-70s, some American coal companies thought the pendulum had swung too far the union's way, none more so than the giant Amex Corporation of Greenwich, Connecticut. Its new chairman was Ian Kinlock McGregor. Exuding a tough self-confidence that Americans describe as a heavy, hands-on management style, McGregor launched Amex into the coal mining business. In 1972, he opened what is today America's third richest mine.
The Bel Air mine at Gillette, Wyoming, led to a coal boom in the western states. Its vast potential was not lost on Ian McGregor, but he saw a problem. Profits on this, his most prized new asset, would be limited if Amex renewed its contract with the union at the mine. At Bel Air, Ian McGregor personally directed a showdown with the United Mine Workers Union and effectively drove them out of the boom states, a blow from which the union has never recovered and for which Amex and other companies are grateful. I believe that Amex wanted to capitalize on that boom and they wanted a workforce of which they could have under their thumb. Uh, that was the reason why they didn't want a labor union to get in their way. The tenacity with which Mr. McGregor advanced on the miners' union made him an attractive proposition to Mrs. Thatcher when she was on the lookout for a heavyweight to take on what she regarded as Britain's most troublesome industries. In America, coal owners negotiated standard agreements with the unions across the industry. But at Bel Air, Ian McGregor decided to break with the others and go it alone. Today, neither Amex nor Mr McGregor wish to discuss their dispute at Bel Air. They insist they weren't out to remove the union. The union is convinced that they were. We had just recently won an election at this Bel Air mine with Amex Coal Company where the men voted to belong to the United Mine Workers Union. The company circulated propaganda around the mines and leafleted that mine, telling those employees that they didn't need to belong to a labor union or to the United Mine Workers in order to work at their Bel Air mine. Amex's row with the union came to a head over pensions. Under the old union pension scheme, a miner could store up his pension credits as he moved from mine to mine, which is common in the USA. But Amex offered a pension deal in which a miner could only get pension credits if he worked for them for 10 years. Anything less than that, and he lost the lot. In January 1975, the miners at Bel Air went on strike. They rejected Amex's final offer on health, pensions, safety and promotion, their resistance hardened by the memory of the Harlan County killing just a few months before. By British standards, their picket was a tame affair. Gillette has never been a hotbed of militant trade unionism. It is not exactly South Yorkshire. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed Tammy Jones is 17... Yes, he's 17 years old and enjoys... Cheering. Gillette is a small, all-American town in the back of beyond. Wealthy and secure with her career. Good job, Tammy. Thank you. Gillette is a far cry from the billion-dollar world of Dallas, but it's a conservative town of which Ronald Reagan would be proud. It was here that Amex launched an aggressive back-to-work campaign. They sent out letters informing us that if we didn't come back to work when they demanded that we did, that uh, we would be replaced, we would be without a job. And I have the letter here that they sent me ordering me back to work, and it says that they intended to open that mine with or without union people and it also says that uh, those employees who have not returned to work by the time that we have completed the hiring and replacement process will be permanently displaced. They wanted a majority of non-union people in that coal mine which they eventually got and after they got that then those of us still on strike received letters that said this Please be advised that as of this date your former job with Amex Coal Company the Bel Air Mine has been posted for bid and will be filled by our present employees, those were non-union employees. To ensure that the mine got back to work with non-union men, Mr. McGregor hired a security firm with a reputation for strike-busting, the Wackenhut Corporation. Named the Emergency Protection Services Unit, it provides the kind of service that might raise a few eyebrows in Britain. Normally we work in conjunction with the local law enforcement uh, agencies. They will start to move the people through the picket lines and we will immediately pick them up as they get to the perimeter of the facility and bring them on in and protect them during the uh, working day. The security personnel are basically the eyes and ears of management. Uh, they're there to report uh, and again protect the property. 
They're not there to get involved in the labor disturbance per se, but simply to report. Now, how do they um, act as the eyes and ears of, of management, and how do they protect the property? Again, uh, looking specifically for illegal picketing, sabotage, uh, miscellaneous mischief, these are all reported and, again, turned into uh, the uh, management uh, strike team, if you will, or strike committee. During our picketing, they would come down with uh, all the guards and the cameras, and they would uh, converse with us and cause us... Uh, the, way, the conversations that we had with them, they would take it all down and take pictures and go back and narrate it and, and uh, use it to uh, take us to court and get restraining orders and limit the amount of pickets and so on and so forth. Uh, tried, uh, they tried to intimidate us uh, with, with guns, uh, revolvers that they carried in the vehicles. Uh, anything they could do to cause confusion. There was no violence. No, uh, no one was ever hit in the eye or anything like that. The Wacken Hut boys wanted us definitely to know that they were armed, that they were tough. But company policy was that there were no arms on the location. They, uh, uh, they didn't want the public to know or believe that uh, they would use arms. How disciplined are your men? I mean, isn't there a danger that because they work for a private company, they might not be as disciplined as the police, who themselves aren't always that disciplined anyway? Well, I mentioned before the mustering of 100 uh, to 300 trained personnel. These are people who have been on six to eight strikes. Uh, we in the Wackenhut Corporation have trained strike coordinators who together with my seven or eight of them have done 500 major strikes over the last 10 years. Uh, they're disciplined. I suppose some people might say that companies like yours are basically anti-trade union. Is that fair? Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. We're in these uh, in these labor disturbances or what have you. We are totally objective. We we take no sides in the uh, in the dispute. As Mr. McGregor's mine got back to full production with non-union labor, the strikers, as a last resort, made concessions to Amex to try to get their jobs back. There was a secret meeting between this man, union lawyer Chip Yablonski, and in McGregor's labor relations chief Roger Solomon. It was a last chance to keep the union in the mine. How close to a deal did you get eventually with Amex? Well, I thought we were this far away. Uh, with Roger Sonneman coming to Washington, everyone knew that he had the year of Ian McGregor. Uh, he would not have been there without McGregor's authorization. Uh, we had nailed down virtually every issue, save, as I mentioned, this returning of the strikers to work. Sometimes that can be a most difficult issue to overcome. In the context of this strike, where there had not been any Molotov cocktails or any kind of massive strike violence or anything of that nature, the return of the strikers would have been a relatively easily negotiated issue uh, between parties that really were anxious to reach an agreement. By this time, they were working the mine. Uh, they just saw the union as an additional impediment. They're working the mine with non-union labor. They were working the mine with uh, with non-union labor, and they just saw the union as an unnecessary impediment. And why reach any agreement with them? Let's keep the whole Powder River, river Basin union free. What happened though to to uh, the agreement that you thought you'd got with Solomon? What response did you get? Well, we never really got a response. Uh, we anticipated that we would. Uh, receive a response that they would move in the direction we'd scripted out the scenario Sonneman and I had. Uh, it just never came to fruition. A decision had obviously been made that they didn't want the union at that time and why even, why even continue the charade? And who do you think was responsible for that? Oh, I, there's no doubt. Uh, with uh, Bel Air being the flagship mine and of AMAX in the West. Uh, this was a decision that was made at the very highest levels of the corporation. Certainly McGregor, uh, whether it included the board of directors or not, I don't know, although that's entirely possible. Ian McGregor. He, uh, that's an interesting meeting that I had with Ian McGregor. I didn't actually get close enough to shake his hand, but uh, a group of us union members went to New York City and were able to get in to a shareholders meeting of AMAX Incorporated. During the strike? Yes, this was during the strike in the summer of 1975. Now, I was able to take a microphone and to ask Ian McGregor a few questions. You see, at that time I didn't really realize that Ian McGregor was the man 
who was controlling what AMAX was doing in regards with the union. And I asked him if he really realized that we had been on strike for this many months. And I asked him when were we going to get a union contract at the Bel Air Mine. Now he said, you will never get a union contract at the Bel Air Mine under any circumstances. Now I, I mentioned that we would just have to see about that and he asked if I was threatening him personally and I said, no, of course not. Since Ian McGregor broke the union at Bel Air, 14 new mines have opened in the Wyoming coalfield, none of them with a union. The companies say their productivity has greatly increased, and while lower grade jobs are less well paid than union rates, more senior posts are better paid. This pay system, it's called incentive grading, is the new American industrial philosophy, and it's caught the interest of the British government. But there's a catch to these non-union mines. Jobs, wages and benefits are not protected by law. They all depend on the state of the market. And of course, there's no right to strike. This, then, is the revolution, ten years on, that Ian McGregor pioneered in the coal fields of the American West. To Mrs. Thatcher, it was a background that prepared him well to bring a revolution to the British coal industry. But some of Mr. McGregor's senior coal board colleagues now seriously question the wisdom of his appointment. There are fundamental differences between the British and American mining industries, which Mr. McGregor's critics feel his mentors may have overlooked. In Britain, the coal industry is nationalised. That came nearly 40 years ago, but the legacy of pre-war coal owners, often indifferent to the suffering of the men, has not been entirely exorcised. To many miners, and not just Arthur Scargill, Ian McGregor's background has revived the fears of a bygone age. And unlike American miners, mining families in Britain live in stable communities where families have often stayed for generations. Some of Mr. McGregor's coal board colleagues feel that he seems to have little grasp of the stress that breaking up mining communities can cause. And then there is his failure, at least so far, to outmaneuver the man from Barnsley who simply won't go away. Can you work with Mr. Scargill? I have no idea. I haven't even tried. The question is, can he work with me? As national president of this union, I'll tell you the terms. No pit closures! No! Unlike Mr. McGregor, Mr. Scargill's plans for remodelling Britain have been dusted down and scrutinised since he was cast as the knave of the British political scene. Like Mr. McGregor, Mr. Scargill is convinced of the righteousness of his cause. As a young man, he wrote, I decided the world was wrong and I wanted to put it right overnight if possible. The closing of the gates at Saltley Coke Depot shut off the last supply of fuel to industry in the miners' strike of 1972. This was the moment that Arthur Scargill's appetite for bringing down conservative governments was whetted. It marked the beginning of the end for Edward Heath. What did it feel like? Absolutely magnificent. All that I've ever stood for in the British trade union movement suddenly came, came, came to a head on this day. And the trade unionists of Birmingham proved a point that once they stand solidly together, nothing on earth can move them. A magnificent feeling. No, we don't want to bring him at all. If he wants a load of coke from here, all he's got to do is to get the appropriate documentation from the local authority. Otherwise, we know it's not true. We know he's kidding. The Saltley blockade began in earnest when Mr Scargill and 400 flying pickets arrived from Barnsley. The man who had spotted the coke lorries leaving the depot was a close and lifelong political friend of the Scargill family, Frank Waters. Mr Waters called for pickets at the depot, but he didn't expect Mr Scargill to send them quite so soon. The biggest headache was just, what do you do with 400 on a Saturday night? I thought he was mad. His reply to me when I said he was mad, he says, comrade, you asked for them, I'm delivering them. Bed and breakfast, look after them. And then, of course, early morning, Scargill arrives like the general. His army had now had arrived, had got embedded, looked after a few pints on the Monday. Some of the lads were going to have, to have a drink during picket time, which meant they were coming at the pub at three o'clock 
and these were the ones that were doing all the shouting. And Scarborough made it quite clear on the Monday night, over at the Star Social Club, he told them, under no circumstances do you leave the picket line without the authority. That food's been provided, transport been provided for the takers for your food, but you don't drink during the day. You can do what you like now at night, but when you're on the picket line, you're getting paid and you're there to picket, not to socialise or to drink. And that there, in my, my opinion, had a tremendous effect on the kind of discipline that was required or the, or, uh, for the rest of the week. With the flying pickets disciplined, Mr Scargill began lobbying for mass support in the local factories. By Thursday, he and others had persuaded 15,000 trade unionists to down tools, join the miners and shut the depot. In many ways, he reminded me of the First World War general. He appeared to be working with a uh, system of good lieutenants. Uh, he would be uh, doing a, a considerable amount of observing from both the front, the back and the sides of the assembled pickets. And uh, these lieutenants, for want of a better word, kept moving in toward and away from him after receiving or apparently receiving instructions. And uh, after these instructions had uh, been uh, uh, moved round the, uh, the, the picket lines, it was then that one saw various things start to develop and happen. And that convinced you that he was in charge? That and uh, the general uh, presence of the man, uh, he was in charge. He knew it. We knew it. He obviously enjoyed the triumph. Uh, he obviously enjoyed making the uh, speech to the, the pickets. Uh, and they obviously enjoyed uh, what he said to them. We know they're going to do him, they say. We're going to do him. No yeah, no filming now, you see. Saltley made Arthur the leader he is today. The lesson of Saltley is quite clear to him today. It's that must pick in the determination of the pickets that will win this strike. Soon, another general will join Mr. Scargill's army, the one he calls General Winter. Soon, the demand for electricity will dramatically increase. If no agreement is reached before these frosty months arrive, the strike will enter a new and daunting phase. First comes the threat of power cuts, then the crunch question. Will the government or the army risk moving coal stocks to the power stations? What, uh, in uh, Arthur Scargill's view, and you have several conversations with him about this, will determine who wins this dispute in the end? I think the key factor which Arthur sees is whether or not the government will be able for to move the 22 million tonnes of coal at the pit heads. When does Arthur Scargill think they'll, the lights will start going out there? Arthur has been speaking around about November of major cuts, maybe cuts maybe before then, but major cuts around about November, as I have heard them say. That coal has got to move through their villages, which they will never get through them villages. And therefore, what happened at Salt Bay, I think I'll give them that kind of confidence that once the call is made, Scargo will be among them, not just telling them what to do. He'll be among them if need be, like he was at Salt Bay, like he's been on the right through the strike of the strike. He will be not one of the generals who will sit in St. James's house in Sheffield drawing the plans up and getting directions, Scargo will be on that picket line, ensuring that call's not moved. Does he, uh, is he afraid of physical violence himself? Well, like all leaders, or good leaders, I would say, revolutionary leaders, I don't think personal safety is a factor, because if it was a factor, then Scargo would have given up. This was Orgreave, Yorkshire, last summer. The hatred between the pickets and the police ran deeper than at Sortley. The results, much uglier. If Mrs Thatcher decides to move coal to the power stations this winter, and if Mr Scargill decrees that it must be stopped, then even these excesses could be surpassed. It is a situation which Mr Scargill himself foresaw, seemed even to hope for, when he reflected on the Saltley picket in an interview with the New Left Review in 1975. He said, 
It may be that we get a strike situation on our hands similar to 72 or 74, where another sortly can occur. If we can get another sortly, then the whole picture can change from one where you have a peaceful road to one where you do not have a peaceful road. In the heart of London's dockland, unmarked to passers-by, are these premises, the Metropolitan Police Public Order Training Centre. There's been close liaison between senior officers here and those at the picket lines. The result could be a new concept in policing thus far alien to this country. Here, police practice firing plastic bullets, CS gas riot guns and water cannon. The police deny training here is specifically geared to the coming winter, but they do say these weapons are an option in a very tight corner. The ideological battle between two men, Mr. Scargill and Mr. McGregor, is bringing to quiet English villages scenes more akin to Poland or Chile. Each man's vision, one shaped in Wyoming, America, the other saltly England, affords little common ground. If tonight's peace talks fail, with General Winter advancing, this transformation of Britain's political landscape will be well underway.